Uh, I am an experimental physicist. And, and uh, what I will show you today is um, one approach to quantum computing, but, uh, and not even a leading approach to quantum computing. In fact, we don't even have a single qubit, uh, just to be frank with you up front. Uh, <laughs> but it's a fascinating one, so I, I hope you, you get excited uh, hearing about this. But uh, I'll, put my, I'll, I'll put this work in a quantum computing context. But first, here is a, an Intel chip. Right, this is what they make in the, in the huge clean rooms in, at Intel. This, uh, this uh, is done by optical lithography on 12-inch uh, wafers of silicon carved into many layers of semiconductor, dielectric, and metal. And these layers are um, produced by tools which I also work with in my quantum nanoscience lab. And if we zoom in on very deeply on one of these, we have billions of these transistors here, which are some kind of silicon uh, channel, gate, dielectric. And so I know how to make maybe one of these, maybe a couple of these in a circuit. I don't know how to make this. And so if we build a quantum computer, I will hand it over to smart people at Intel factory or another big, big uh, industrial plan to figure out how to build a quantum computer. <coughs> now, uh, what Krista did not mention to you is the actual challenge we all struggling with and it's something very different between the Intel chip I just showed you and a quantum system is this issue of decoherence. So there, it's very easy to lose quantum information and the reason for that is because in that silicon transistor information is stored in about a thousand electrons. And the fluctuation in that number, 90, 990, 1011, that's all the same. That's the same state, that's one. Now here, information is stored in a single quantum particle, like an electron, like the spin of an electron. And so that flips, we lose information. And so one uh, particular ch channel for how information can be lost is by sitting here in the one state of a qubit, in the excited state, and then just falling down by emitting a photon, for example, falling down to the ground state. That's like tumbling off of this stage, for example. That's similar to that. So that's one way of losing quantum information. And then some people have a smart idea. Well, this is proportional to this delta E. The larger this energy difference between the two levels, the higher the probability of this process. So why don't we eliminate delta E. Why don't we work with energy levels that are all degenerate? We have some other way of figuring out which one is zero, which one is one. Not the energy. Energy difference is zero. So then maybe there is no decoherence. Well, this is not um, very easy to do, to have a, a lot of energy levels that are all at zero. And also, it is not robust to loss of decoherence because if I wiggle this level a little bit here, then there will be again an energy difference between them and there will be uh, a way for decoherence to come in again. And so then quantum physicists, ma mathematicians who study topology teamed up and came up with an approach to rigidly pin a lot of energy levels to zero so that they cannot deviate. And so topology is behind all this and hence Topological quantum computing is the topic of my talk. And now I'm going to make a uh, detour into actually particle physics. Okay? And hopefully it will come back to qubits eventually. So um, particle physics, uh, there, there is a representation of fermion operators where we just say, okay, here is an operator for creating a fermion like an electron. And it's a number with a real and imaginary part, okay? So this multiplied by the wave function, you create a fermion. That's the creation operator. That's the annihilation operator. So we, we kill an electron, we remove an electron for a system, or we add a hole where electron was. Okay, so this is... Uh, and then we write them in this real and imaginary uh, representation. That's just a linear transformation from Cs to gammas. And let's just call these gamma operators Majorana operators after a brilliant uh, uh, physicist, Ettore Majorana, who lived in the 1930s. 
Um, and let's just say, okay, electron is a box that has two of these Majoranas, gamma 1 and gamma 2. And of course, it's an electron. You cannot split them apart. They are traveling together, making an electron, uh, these two Majoranas. So, um, okay, but what if we could break the box and take the two Majoranas and split them apart? What if we could split an electron in two? That would be the way to... Um, make sure that that electron is not perturbed by any decoherence for us. Okay, so what if we could do this, right? What if we could work with individual Majoranas? Well, turns out if we could do that, then these new operators, gamma 1 and gamma 2, have some very interesting properties. For example, if they're confined to this uh, face of this screen, to this 2D surface, then they obey very strange exchange rules, as opposed to fermions or bosons. If I take two nominally identical Majoranas, they're just different color just so that we keep track of them, and I swap them like this, I have to change their states following these two equations. And so what used to be gamma 1 plus I gamma 2, following these rules, becomes gamma 1 minus gamma 2. And so I went from an annihilation operator, which is maybe a zero state of my qubit, to a creation operator, which is a one state, or by taking two particles, two of these Majoranas, and moving them around, I have created another electron in the system. I have created it where it wasn't before. So that's pretty bizarre, and regular fermions and bosons don't do that. If you exchange them, nothing happens. The universe does not know, but here, universe is somehow supposed to know that this happened. And so the idea is to store quantum information in the braids of Majorana fermions. So we keep track of how many times we swapped them, and electrons pop here and there. And this is a way to run a quantum algorithm. So a quantum computer, based on this principle, will look nothing like the Intel classical computer that I showed you, right? It would require a completely different way to manipulate qubit states to implement the CNOT gates and other gates that Krista showed you to read the state of this qubit, all of this will be, will look very, very different. Okay, so a little bit about these Majorana fermions. Um, because they're real uh, numbers, they are their own antiparticles. That's a technical term, but let's just think about uh, what it means. So creation of a Majorana is the same as an annihilation of a Majorana. So it's its own antiparticle. How to think about this um, and where to find them? Well, um, Ettore Majorana himself proposed to look for Majorana fermions at this boundary between matter and antimatter. So if you are your own antiparticle, this is a very good spot for you to be because right at this green line, it's not clear whether you're matter or antimatter, you kind of both, right? So another way to think about this is this ball floating in the water. It makes a hole with its own reflection. You, you think it's one ball, but half of it is, an, is a reflection and half of it is a real ball. That's like a Majorana fermion living at the boundary between matter and antimatter being its own antiparticle. Now, we want to make a computer out of it, so we cannot literally follow Ettore Majorana's work because he thought that neutrinos uh, are Majorana fermions, and there is still an ongoing search to confirm that prediction. But we cannot build a computer out of neutrinos. We can't even catch a single neutrino very easily. Uh, so we are going to do it in a superconductor. And so our matter will be electrons, and our antimatter will be holes, and we will be looking for a spot right in between electrons and holes where we have an equal quantum superposition of an electron and a hole, and th those quasi-particles, not real particles, but quasi-particles, will be our Majorana fermions. So how this is going to come about, it was uh, figured out by brilliant uh, physicist and mathematician Alexei Kitaev. And was what he did, he uh, put um, together a toy model, which is known as a Kitaev chain. So, Basically, what you do is you put a chain of fermions together, right? Now, uh, I explained what these boxes are. Each is a fermion with two Majoranas in it. And then, uh, Kitaev came up with a way, it's called 
P-wave superconducting couplings, actually spinless P-wave, which doesn't exist in nature. But, you know, as a, as a toy model, of uh, a theoretical physicist, that's uh, uh, easy enough. And what that does is it shifts the boundaries of the boxes by one. Okay, so now here is the P-wave coupled chain. All the same stars, but the boxes are drawn differently. So there is one unpaired one here, and there is another unpaired one here. So in a spinless P-wave, one-dimensional chain, uh, there will be unpaired Majorana fermions at the two ends of the chain. And this is what we set out to do in a real physical system. This exact model is not possible to implement, but there were some other um, theoretical predictions. Uh, for example, these two brilliant papers from 2010 that came out within one week that said that you should just take a semiconductor nanowire, which is what I, we had in the lab, these nanowires are a few microns long and a, a hundred nanometers in diameter, and they're single crystal, beautiful uh, objects that grow like a forest on uh, chips uh, from gold particles that sit here, which are catalysts for these uh, nanowires. And then this nanowire has to have a strong spin orbit interaction. Okay, you just choose the right semiconductor for that, and then we need to apply superconductivity to it and emerge it in magnetic field. So that's four ingredients, and the prediction is you put this all together, it will give you the exact replica of the Kitaev spinless P-wave chain. We'll have Majorana fermions at the ends of the nanowire. So here and here. Okay, so this is what we did, and uh, you can look at the uh, Death Star Destroyer uh, representation of our device that the science liked, uh, it's the work of an undergraduate student. Or you can look at the SEM picture, uh, this scale is about one micron here. Uh, so we took a nanowire of indium antimonide, we uh, put a superconductor on top of it, so that will induce superconductivity in the nanowire, and this apparatus here is for probing the Majorana, it's a, it's it's a non-superconducting metal. All these lines underneath are uh, control, control knobs. Like in a transistor, you have a gate. These are also gates, but there are several gates because this is a more complicated device. Um, if you ever hold a copy of this journal in your hand, you will also see a face of Ethereum Majorana that we snuck in <laughs> here and here because this is, where, this is where the particle is supposed to appear at the end. Yeah, the editors were not so happy. <laughs> so basically what we set out to do is to put particle physics on a semiconductor chip, right? So here you have the CERN, came out the same year as uh, the Higgs boson, which was discovered at the CERN, but it's a m much cheaper uh, particle, and uh, I think it's a pretty cool particle. It's on antiparticle, but it's on a semiconductor chip. Okay. So what was the evidence that we found these Majorana fermions? Well, uh, the prediction was that because it's right at the boundary between matter and antimatter, it should happen at zero energy. And zero energy in our experiment is a zero voltage between the two electrodes, the golden one and the superconducting one. And uh, so this is an electrical experiment where we apply source drain voltage bias across a nanowire and we measure current. It's the simplest experiment you can imagine in physics. You just pass a current and the prediction is that at zero energy there will be a little bit extra current. So this zero bias peak is what was the evidence of Majorana fermions. Now this, these huge features that it lives in are from superconductivity that's well understood for about 50 years um, and the peak onsets at finite field. So zero, field is zero here, and then we step the field up in 10 millitesla increments, and at about 100 millitesla, this peak appears. So this was the experimental signature that my runners must be there. Now, this is still very far from building them into a qubit, and this is kind of where we are still at. So we are trying to explore more details of this experiment, but how would we build a qubit out of this? Well. A qubit would be something like this. There will be some, several Majoranas sitting in a nanowire. And first, let me tell you how we would tell 
the difference between the qubit 0 and the qubit 1 state. For that, we need to fuse Majoranas, right? So think about it. They're their own antiparticles. What happens when a particle meets an antiparticle? They annihilate, and some energy gets released. So something like this happens with, with these Majoranas when they meet, and so we have to be able to bring them together. And then they annihilate, and two things can happen. Either there was an electron contained in this pair, or there was a hole. There was no electron. So this pair was either empty or full. And these are the two qubit states. So we should be able to read charge after we fuse the Majoranas. Now, this also explains why there are two other Majoranas here. That's quite fundamental. So there is, okay, there is a charge conservation law in this universe. And so I was telling you about creating electrons. That's not really possible. Electron has to come from somewhere to be here. And so it will come from this other pair in case it's localized here. And then if we're at zero, it means the electron was sitting on the outer Majoranas. Okay? So for charge conservation, we need at least four Majoranas for one qubit. Now, how do we do a qubit operation, right? How do we go from zero to one? Well, it turns out that's not really possible in a nanowire. So here's a nanowire with two Majoranas. I need to exchange them, right? I need to swap them, braid them. And if they're confined to this one-dimensional object, there is no way to braid them without them meeting somewhere in the middle, and then they annihilate. So we need to avoid that. So there was a clever idea a few years ago. You have to use a T-junction. Okay? So this is like... Um, you and your neighbor want to swap cars in a narrow alley. So this is kind of like this. So let's take this Majorana and put it in this leg. Okay, now this one can go across. And now we can uh, extract the other one from, uh, from the third leg. Okay, easy enough, right? Well, except now we, you know, we, we know how to grow these one-dimensional wires. Now we need to grow nanowire networks. We need to braid them around, and we need more than one qubit. So you can imagine we need a very multi-branched network. And we need to learn how to grow uh, semiconductors that allow us to do that. So luckily, we can do some of that. For example, we had this device made where two nanowires grew into each other and made this cross. So this is perfect to do this braiding operation, because we can have Majorana sitting on these corners, and we can swap them around. Um, and so this is one device that goes in the direction of qubits. Here are a lot of other devices that my lab and other labs are working on based on nanowires, superconductors, semiconductors. And for example, this one is based on a T-junction. Here is a, a T, and there are some superconducting loops for readout and manipulation. Uh, here is a device with four Majoranas, right? So you can uh, think about doing fusion, readout. And here are many other devices coupling uh, Majoranas to other types of qubits, like superconducting qubits. And this one, um, since I figured everyone mentions Richard Feynman, uh, I don't have a picture of him. But um, we are working on uh, doing what he explicitly wanted to do, so to emulate quantum systems with other quantum systems. And so this is a system where we create a Kitayev chain, which I told you is impossible, but we try to implement it verbatim. So by having these sites and uh, coupling them by spinless P-wave coupling, we hope that the end sites, for example, this dot left and dot right, would pop up Majoranas in this discrete fashion, exactly like Kitayev has predicted, in the philosophy of Richard Feynman to use semiconductor quantum systems to emulate actually impossible things that don't exist in nature, the spinless P-wave superconductors. OK, this is the, uh, the end of my talk.